morning, church. Good to see everyone. All those watching online, welcome. We invite everyone to join us as we worship this morning. There is a song I know it well, a melody that's never failed on mountains high in valleys low. My soul will rest, my confidence in you. opportunity to meet together, to just lift your name up and to worship you. And so God, we ask you to come and meet with us. Speak to us through the song, speak through us through the message this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Your mercy never 
experience the goodness of God. Let's give him some praise this morning, church. Last week, we learned this uh, new song called Sovereign of God. And uh, of course, the chorus we, we talked about came from the, the verse in Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And of course, the whole concept of that verse and, and the whole context of that verse is that our prosperity is not here on this earth. It's 
heaven, right? And so this week as I was just meditating on that verse and on the words of this, of this song, uh, the first line of this song says this, there is strength within our sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And I just stopped for a second and I was like, what does that mean? Because we don't usually think of sorrow and tears as something that is beautiful and filled with strength, do we? We usually look at that as weakness, but I then remembered what that verse said. And I remembered what God said. The purpose of our life is for what? To bring him honor and glory. Not me. Not riches on this earth, but riches someday. And I thought, oh, I get it. And I started to remember, have you ever been to a funeral of somebody who served God their whole life? Who just, I mean, was a loving person and a serving kind of a heart and you get there and yes you shed tears because they're no longer here but there's something beautiful in the air amen the holy spirit is just around you and comforting you even though you're experienced this great loss but you're saying but i know how wonderful their life was their life was for god's glory and i said and so as i was thinking back on that i said that is beauty in tears. It's when even in my sorrows, even when I'm at my worst, I know that God is working for my good. And I know you've all experienced different times in your life. And I know this year we've seen people experience loss of jobs, loss of loved ones. And yet I have seen the beauty in that sorrow. I have seen the strength in that sorrow. I've seen the beauty in the tears that were shed because these people are still serving God. They still love God. And it's just a great reminder of what that verse really means. Don't worry about prosperity here on this earth. Worry about just bringing honor and glory to God. And that someday, someday, we will all be prosperous in Him. Amen. We have a future. We, has a, we have a hope that we just sang about. And so as we sing those words this morning, I want you to think back to a time when you saw strength within sorrow and beauty in tears. And as you think about that, just praise God for that. Praise God for what he does in the lives of believers who even suffer. And just ask him, Lord, when it's my turn to suffer, help me to be victorious just as much. Let's sing that together.
for our good, Lord. God, I want to pray for those right now who find themselves in the valley, who find themselves feeling less than prosperous right now. God, may they remember your promises. May they remember that the reward is not here on earth, but with you in heaven. May they remember that their lives are for your glory and continue to press into your love continue to show faith through all circumstances, God. Strengthen them this morning for the road ahead. Lord, once again, help them to feel your peace and your presence as they go through their suffering. Lord, thank you for the way that you love your people, the way you show us to love others. May we show that love to everyone we meet. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, church family, and welcome. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're glad you're here. 
If you're new to Grace, we hope that you'll allow us to get to know you by filling out a connection card. This is a way to simply let us know you were here, submit a prayer request, or ask for more information about Grace. You can find our digital connection card at gcchapel.org slash connect, or you can find a paper copy tucked inside your bulletin. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, friends, I've got a couple of quick reminders and then some exciting things to share after that. First of all, your 2020 giving statements are ready. They're in your mail files today. And if you weren't aware, yes, the mail files are in use again. If you're not attending in person and need yours mailed to you, please contact the church office and we'll be happy to send it out. Second, if you would like to learn more about our church or would like to become a member, we invite you to check out our next steps process. Our next round of classes are coming up in February. Please head to our website and click on next steps at the top to learn more and to register. Okay, on to the more exciting stuff. This afternoon from 3 to 4 p.m., we invite you to join us for a fireside chat with some of our newest missionaries. Anna and Eric will be joining us live to share about their ministries. They both have a focus and a passion for reaching the unreached with the gospel by engaging and equipping and mobilizing Christian young people and professionals to take the good news all throughout the world. The fireside chat will be held in person in the worship center and will also be live streamed. If you'd like to attend in person, we ask that you register ahead of time. We've added a new missionaries link at the top right corner of our homepage. Just click that link to find out more information and to register for the fireside chat. Part of the reason we want you to get to know Anna and Eric is that we are helping them raise support. As part of this process, we're asking you to consider making a commitment above your normal missions giving. Since they're approved missionaries, you can start giving to Anna and Eric today. Here's how to start. First, fill out a missions commitment form. There's two ways to do this. You can find a paper copy in your bulletin or we have a digital form on our website. Second, start giving. There are also two ways to do this. If you'd like to give by check, simply put it in an offering envelope and use the love offering section to designate the amount and who it's for, Anna and or Eric. You can also give online at gcchapel.org slash give. Designate the amount you'd like to give in the other category and then use the specify other comment field to let us know who it's for. Whether you plan to give by check or online, please continue to designate Anna and or Eric until May. We'll have a congregational meeting to officially approve the amounts. And after that, you'll be able to just add the amount to your monthly missions giving. And remember, this is above and beyond what you're already giving to missions. You can find all this information and more at gcchapel.org slash new missionaries. All right, everyone, that's all I've got for today. Have a good one and we'll catch you later. Good morning. We are here and we have Anna and Eric with us. This is a great time where if you don't know them, three o'clock is a great time to come back out. And again, if you don't want to come here, we are streaming it so you can watch it wherever you are and to hear their hearts and, and to understand their ministry better. Please realize that part of support raising is we don't want to just add names to a wall to say, look at all the names on a wall. We want to understand what their hearts are and what their needs are and really connect and, and to walk through ministry with them. So that's what today is geared towards as well as all of the contact information you will have that if you want to follow up with them and understand more about their ministries, we'd encourage you to do that. So that's again, three o'clock today. What we're going to do is we're going to start by praying for Anna and Eric and their ministries that are coming ahead of them. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for being a God who loves us and cares for us, and being a God who didn't just put the world into motion and tell us that you had everything under control and that we don't have to do anything, but you have called us and equipped us and, and really uh, given us passions and talents to, to be part of the furthering of your kingdom. As we've said, it's we are the hands and feet that bring good news, and Lord, for some of us, that's in our everyday life, and for others, you have called to vocational ministry. And so, Lord, we want to be praying for Eric and Anna as they've been called to go full-time into ministry, to, to use their, their giftings and what you've blessed them with to reach the world with the good news. Lord, we, we know there are challenges in that. We know that there are 
there are plenty of struggles as you adjust to new areas and, and travel and sometimes wanting, wondering when that next paycheck is coming. And Lord, there's uncertainty there, but we pray that you already are going before Eric and Anna. We pray that you are already prepping support teams and prepping the financial needs that you are able to control. We also even are asking that you are already working on the soil to, to turn the soil over so that when they are into the field or when they are equipping people to go into the field, that field is ripe to have seeds fall into fertile soil. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you have called all of us to participate in your kingdom, but ask that we take a special interest this weekend to understand Eric and Anna's specific call into the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ and just the privilege it is to walk beside them through that process. And Lord, we ask those things knowing that you have called us and you have prepared the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. So as, uh, as we get going, we, have, uh, we are back into Luke 15. So we are back into our series, uh, Eating with Jesus. This is another one of those... Uh, Areas in which, if you want to get technical, Jesus isn't eating, but there is a big feast that's about to be thrown. So, it fits what we want to cover. We're actually in the parable of the prodigal son, and so, or really as it talks about, it's the parable of the two sons. So there are two sons in this parable. There's actually a lot of information going on, and, and for me, it was actually too much to cover in one Sunday, so we are actually going to be taking two Sundays to cover it. Today, we're going to focus on the prodigal. Next week, we're going to focus on the other, the son that was there and stayed behind. So a lot of information. We're going to read through the story and, and make sure we can put that into context. This is one of those stories that hopefully it is familiar to you, and we will use it as a jumping off point, but we will start by uh, reading through reading through the parable. So we are in Luke 15. It starts in verse 11, and so we'll be reading 11 to the end of the chapter. Luke 15. It says, and he, and since we're hopping into the middle, I like to put the, to make sure we realize this is Jesus talking. So it says, and Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took it in a journey into a far-off country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robes and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what, what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when, his son of, but when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to his son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, 
For this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So, this is one of those stories that even if you're not from a Christian background, this is referenced in all types of culture. Like the prodigal is a concept that is written into literature and referenced in just sayings of, of people in, in a variety of different ways. It's one of those stories that we, we know about, and yet sometimes we overgeneralize it into just that, well, someone wanders off and someone comes back, and yet there's a lot of things going on in this story. And so for us, like, we need to start by putting it in the context of we read the, the part of this chapter that had to do with the feast, the eating, but we start with what's the audience of this subgroup. And the audience is in the first part of this chapter, 15 verse 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus to hear him. So tax collectors and sinners, the people who no one loves, no one likes, no one wants to be around, Jesus is accepting them to be close and talking to them. Two, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus decides, or Jesus tells them a parable. So it's good to recognize that the audience here is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes. The audience is the individuals, the, the religious self-righteous. And again, we reminded us last week of all of the things we've learned about the Pharisees. The religious self-righteous who have said, all right, like this is, what I, this is what Jesus is teaching me. Again, if we've remembered, Jesus has done a few different things, like compassion towards the Pharisees, kept teaching them, kept teaching them, got to the point of yelling at them. We know the Pharisees are not a fan of Jesus. We know how the story ends. They become less and less of a fan and end up being part of the killing of Jesus. So we know this story, but this is Jesus hearing the Pharisees and, and wanting to have them still learn. This is actually in the context of chapter 15. Jesus doesn't just tell one parable. He tells three right in a row. He tells the parable of the lost sheep, and then he tells the parable of the lost coin, and then he tells the parable of the two sons. So three right in a row, first two were skipping over, hopping into the prodigal, but there's a, a flow here, and you can say all three of them kind of fit the same flow of there's something found that gets lost, that then comes back, is, is, or I should say something that was safe, gets lost, is found, and is restored with rejoicing and repentance. You kind of see that flow in all three stories, you know? Even if we, still earlier in 15, both the sheep and the lost coin end with, so I tell you there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who didn't need repentance. Again, rejoicing because of repentance. Rejoicing, the angels rejoiced in 10, over the repentance. So the flow seems the same, but this one seems to have some more depth to it. You can tell by even looking at the chapter. Prodigal, two sons, much longer story. And so for us, we want to know what's going on in the story. Now, even though the audience is the church, I would say that more of the church, like we're much more in the audience that the story is being told to. This story is not told to the prodigal person. This story is told to Pharisees. It's told to the people sitting around wanting to learn about Jesus, or God at least. So for us, we're probably the target of this story. There is a sub-audience. The tax collectors and sinners weren't sent away. So I'm sure they are still listening. I'm sure Jesus wants them to hear the mercy and grace that is being offered. But that's not who this was geared towards. Geared towards Pharisees. So for us, we're going to walk through the prodigal. So let's walk through the prodigal's decision-making process or his walk through the story. So we'll start there in 11. Man has two sons, the younger, the one we call the prodigal, goes to his father and says, Father, give me the share of the property. I'd like my portion of inheritance. If you know anything about inheritance, inheritance is given upon death. So this is again the son saying, I am done with you. Let me have the money. There's a lot of actual things going on in this story that like are cultural references so I want to explain some, but I think I can give a modern analogy or an example that we will understand, that then we can better retroactively understand what's going on in the son's request. 
So, modern example, analogy. I have two siblings, uh, older brother, younger sister. Say my parents uh, bought the three of us a car to share. They didn't. I still remember it, mom and dad. All right, I, you know, like... But say they bought, me, bought us a car, and they said, all right, this is your three. You have to, you have to rearrange your schedules. You have to find balance. All of you have equal right to it, like you're going to use it. Now, say I'm the ungrateful son, all right? I could go, well, I don't want the car. I want a third of the value so that I can go and do something else with the money. But do you see how it's this weird bind? Because the parents aren't just going to cut a third of the car off and sell the third of that car. Because the car is an entity on its own. It's an asset that's really depreciating. And of course, I'd want a third of the original purchase price, you know, maxed out, you know. So I want this money that then they're going to have to figure out how do we find. Like, it's extra cost. It's not just as simple as, Jason doesn't have the car, we'll sell parts of it, and then he gets money. You could do the same analogy as if you did it with a, a pet. Like if, if the three siblings shared a dog, and I got tired of the dog, and say, well, I want my third of my investment out of the dog so I can take that money and send it somewhere else. Like, it doesn't change the dog's needs. I don't get to cut a third of the dog off and say, we don't need this third of the dog, and we can sell that third so that Jason gets his money. Now, if we hop back into the story, younger son goes to the father. Pharisees, and, remember, audience, Pharisees and teachers of the law. Quick Old Testament lesson. Promised land, you're given your land as a family entity. You can't even sell your land permanently because there's this thing called the year of Jubilee that comes around and you get your land back. So like you're kind of attached to your land and here's this son who goes, give me a third of your net worth or give me my portion of your net worth so that I can go and do what I want with it. It's not like the father just goes to the bank and takes a chunk of money out of the bank and goes, here you go, because his money is his, his land and, and what he produces and, and it's something that he just can't get rid of. He can't sell a third of his field. This is a very arrogant request from a son who thinks he can do better. Like, this is not as simple as I want money. This is that whole car dog thing of the father doesn't naturally go, sure, I'll cut a third of the car off and give it to you in cash. There's, there's cost here, and, and there's, there's an issue here of, like, what do we do with figuring out how to get that money? So this arrogant request is something that the, the Pharisees are going to hear. They're going to understand that we as Jews are tied to our land, and it's our land, and no, it's not just sell it, move off the land, and never get it back, but we're tied by family groups and by tribes to certain sections of the land. And so this arrogant request of, I think I can do better than you, Dad, just give me the money now. That's the starting point here. And so the request is made, and in the parable, the father decides to grant the request. And so the father gathers it and gives it to him. If you pick up there in verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far off country. So he left. So again, there's, there's things going on here. He's, he's left his his community. He's left his whole support system. So the son who says, man, I think I can do better than my dad, not only goes, I want my money, but I want to completely remove myself from my support system, from my network of contacts. And again, put that into the Jewish culture of like, it is all about community, and he doesn't just leave his community, he leaves to another country. He's, he's out of that support system. For us, that's, in a lot of ways, that's, that's how you run from, from things you don't like being over you. And again, fill in your excuse. Like, I, I don't want to listen to you, or I don't want to be controlled by you, or you're not the boss of me, or like whatever excuse you want to put in there. 
you leave and you get away, and, and even in the church, it's, listen, if you stick around church long enough, it's, it's like people are praying for you and, and trying to hold you accountable and trying to tell you that, man, you know, that God has ways he wants you to live, and how do you run from that? You, you get out of church. You leave the support system to say it's a whole lot easier to do what I want outside of the support system. That's what the son's doing. Leaves the support system, leaves the country, and goes off. And what does he do? He squanders all of the money. You can even see it there. Not only just squanders, but loses it all in reckless living. And when he had to spend everything, a severe famine came, and he then has to figure out how to meet his needs. So he's left his support system, but let's even do, just as a FYI, let's do a little rabbit trail hypothetical. What if the prodigal would have left his support system with the money, invested, and became that version of a millionaire? Like, is it a success story? There's still cost there. Understand, like, there's still cost of loss of family relationship. The father has literally said, my son has called me dead. So what has been dead, he is rejoicing that is now alive again. There's still cost of lack of relationship and, and brokenness and lack of community and, and structure and support network. So even if the prodigal went off and made money off the inheritance, there's still brokenness in this story. So even in the hypothetical, if someone's like, well, that was just bad investments and they want to recreate the story, the brokenness is still there. The dead are still dead and you're still arrogantly telling your, your family that I do not need you. So even in the best case scenario, they're still hurt, but this is the worst case scenario. He needs stuff and he doesn't have money, so he goes and hires himself out to the citizens of the country who put him to work feeding pigs. So again, this is one of those, a lot of cultural stuff within here. Jesus has picked a very specific job that the Pharisees, the audience, would go, this is rock bottom. This is as bad as bad gets. Not only pigs on clean animals, like these are things that like Pharisees don't even want to touch or be around. And then Jesus pushes it as far as saying that the, the son was thinking about eating the food the pigs were eating. Like that could have been like physical reaction by the Pharisees going, that's disgusting. If you think this is something that's made up, you could even go into the, the Apocrypha even has a story along these lines in 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees 6 has the story in which a scribe was put to the sword and told, you either let pork touch your lips or we kill you. And he's celebrated for saying, I'd rather die than have pork touch my lips. Like, I'm not promoting this, I'm not putting this up, but I'm just saying, the Pharisees know these type of stories and have this type of pride to say, I would rather die a martyr than touch a pig. Even though I think touching a pig is not the definition of martyrdom, but that's, a, that's another conversation. All right? So, so when Jesus picks this concept to say, the prodigal has stooped to not only hanging out with the pigs, but wanting to eat with the pigs, He's basically said, this is as low as low comes. And this is rock bottom. And this is where your sub-audience comes back into play of the, the Pharisees and, I mean, the tax collectors and the sinners are hearing this because you have Jesus talking rock bottom and yet it's redeemable. It's it's still able to be brought back. It's still something that can be restored. Now, now with this, the son right now has hardened himself and has decided that instead of admitting maybe my dad's right, I'd rather make worse decisions and make my circumstances worse than admit maybe I was wrong. And continues to slide. For us, that's not feeding pigs anymore. But 
we have individuals who, who in the world around us have hit what they would call rock bottom. And, and those are some of those toughest conversations you can have with people. This is where mercy and grace needs extended even more. And, and I have not been around for super long, but I've had tough conversations with people who've said, but, but Jason, I've, I've actually sold my body. Like I've prostituted myself. God doesn't want that. And yet it's redeemable. And, and you're not beyond love and affection. Some of the harder ones, the burdens the people carry that they refuse to forgive themselves. The individual who had an abortion and just goes, I can't carry the burden of knowing that I killed my own baby. And yet, you're, you're not beyond redemption. And yet, we are the religious people who, in those conversations, when she goes, but last church I told, they told me to get out of here because it was unforgivable of what I'd done. And that's not what this story is saying. It's Jesus picking the low of the low and, and really having the prodigal who's made his situation worse. Not only did he have arrogance and ask for money, dad, you're dead. Not only did he waste his money, now not only has he wasted his money, but now is he in the pig pen wanting to eat what the pigs eat, starving to death. And he goes, but he's redeemable. He, he's not lost beyond hope. And, and that's the message here. Part of the, the core of this, this parable is you're, you're not lost beyond hope. Then when you sit here and you go, man, Jason, if you just knew, if this church just knew, I'd be chased out again. Like, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the hope that you have to restore. Now, the, the other side of that, understand when the when the son who finally makes a good decision and comes back, he, he doesn't bring the pigs with him. He turns from the pigs and goes, I don't need this. It doesn't define me, and he leaves them. So sometimes the church still struggles when someone shows up at the door going, here's all of my sin, and no, I will not run from it. I'm keeping it. Now love me now. That can get sticky too, because guess what? Like, if the prostitutes show up at our door, our first advice is, yes, we want to love you, and yes, we want you to stop being a prostitute. That's, that's not what you stay as an occupation. I don't care if you're going to tithe from it. You know, like, it's, it's, that's not what you do. So there's this, this balance here, but what one of the core things that the Pharisees do not miss that Jesus is going to redeem the pig farmer. Like, the Pharisees don't miss that statement. We sometimes summarize that way too quickly, but the Pharisees get this. Rock bottom, low of low, Jesus is saying has still has worth. Luckily, the, the hardened heart, the son's hardened heart was softened, and we see that there starting in 17. It says, now, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here in hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So he even has a speech he practices to say, listen, I'm going to go before God, I'm going to go before my father, and here's my practice speech. And He's going to seek repentance, but, but not restoration. Like, his best case scenario is, his father goes, all right, I'll throw you into the servants' quarters. You can be low man on totem pole, no seniority, but I'll let you work here and make sure you're fed. That's his best case scenario. So he's approaching going, man, I don't even know if I'm redeemable, and yet he's moving. And then we see the father's reaction. If we hop in the middle of verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Hopping down to 22 after he gives his, he gives his pre, uh, prearranged speech. And, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand. Like he's my family, ring on his hand. Shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and we celebrate. 
For what was dead is alive, and what was lost is found. The father welcomed him home with open arms, fully pardoned, fully restored. He didn't need the son to say, can I, can I live with you and show you that I've changed? It's, it's the example of mercy and grace that is offered before the son can even get to the father's feet. This is literally what Romans tells us over and over again. But Romans 3, when it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Like, the Old Testament law was never a, if you keep this, God will love you. It was never a, I can get God's love. It was just a, hey, do you realize how much you're a sinner? It was to to point towards, what is it to point towards? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We've used that word justified before. We've defined it before. This is an unbelievable term that talks about legal right standing in which you're declared innocent and righteous, in which everything is forgiven and you're given the credit as if you lived to the standard you were supposed to. The example I've often used is it's as if you played a board game and you get caught cheating. And not only has God forgiven you of the cheating, but he declares you the winner of the game. You didn't win the game. You were the cheater in the game, and yet you've been justified in God's sight. That's the message. None of us have earned our way into heaven or kept enough rules or farmed enough land or given enough money or done enough tasks in which God goes, man, I'm required to love you, aren't I? It's mercy and grace that has been poured out. That's, what, that's what's being poured out here. And again, from the audience being told, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, it is not being missed that even the person in the pigsty is loved by God when they turn and there's the rejoicing in their repentance to say, i I've screwed up. And God is quick with mercy and grace to go, I've already forgiven and I've already declared you righteous. Perfect. This is is an unbelievable story in this grace that is offered. The fact of, as the Father says, what was dead is alive. What was lost is found. And so for us, it becomes this this great question of, one, odds are, we're not the prodigal, as in, we're not the extreme of the prodigal. We're sitting in church, like the prodigal wouldn't be sitting in church. That doesn't mean there's not aspects of our life that we've allowed to go into the prodigal direction. It doesn't mean you're not like, this is the last Sunday because I am removing my support system and running from this. But right now, we're, we're not the prodigal, but is there parts of our life that we've allowed to become prodigal, to allow us to define, or us to, as the, as the son did, to stubbornly refuse to admit that we were wrong and to let ourselves get buried deeper and deeper because of our pride or our arrogance or our self-importance? Those are some some great questions from us as the church. The the second aspect of this is how are we trying to love the prodigals who aren't stepping foot in the door because they're going, well, that's just the group that's going to judge me. The Pharisees don't get this, and we know the Pharisees killed Jesus, or at least they're very complicit in it. They're the ones who are shuddering, going, no, we don't accept the pig, pig farmer. Like, great story, Jesus, unacceptable ending. Pig farmers don't come back. We as the church can't be the people saying, sorry, and whatever the the bottom line is, sorry, the the prostitutes or the the sinners, the, and and we can run a whole list, They, they just can't come back. Like, we just don't accept them here. That's what mercy and grace is. That's what gets poured out. You'll even notice if you're 
looking at your sermon notes, whether online or in the bulletin, that at the bottom I put Mark Stevens' contact information. So again, we've, for the last year, had a, a counselor here at church who's professional counselor, who's, this is his full-time job, and he's giving some of his hours, or at least we're, we're, we're consuming some of his hours here at church to help people work through this mess. Because if you're the pig farmer on your way back, it's not always you solving it on your own. And, and understand, like, you might go, well, I don't know who Mark is, and I don't know if he's the right person to talk to. The reason I put his contact is, one, he's, he's our central point, but he's a great filter. We actually do have three or four uh, counselors within our church who, who have different specialties, and Mark's a great person to, to sort through to say, hey, this person is the best to help you in this situation, and this person might be better to help you. So this is not a you have to go to Mark, but he might be the great person, and, and this might be, man, my, my kid needs someone to talk to, or our marriage is falling apart, or I, I just don't know how to get over this sin pattern that I'm in, or this addiction I'm in, or this pride that it is always someone else's fault and never mine, or whatever your fill in the blank is. What we're here as the church and called to do is to be very quick in offering mercy and grace and rejoice with those who are repenting to say, I need to turn from my sin. That's kind of the definition of who we are. Is it easy? No. Is it awkward? Most of the time. Is it easy to run from your support system to say, I don't want that stuff in my life or the awkwardness or it's easy to run from the support system. But here's Jesus telling a story that is not missed to the religious righteous, saying, maybe mercy and grace is needed to be seen a little quicker. And maybe the unredeemable are a little more redeemable than you think. And maybe it's our heart issues and our pride and our selfishness that is in the way. And how do we work through that then? Those are tough questions, but those are questions that the prodigal is being asked, or at least Jesus is asking the Pharisees through a simple parable about a prodigal son. Next week, we'll work on the son who stayed behind and what his issues might be, but grace and mercy is offered to anyone who needs it. Still is our prayer and still is our call. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for being a God who loves us and cares for us and really drives that home. And, and, and Lord, so often our outward lives, because we're sitting in church or we're attached to church, aren't going to look like the prodigals. Like we might not hit rock bottom and yet there's many times in which our pride and our arrogance gets in the way and we refuse to admit that maybe we're wrong or Maybe we need help. Lord, even for things like the, the sorting, and I, I thank you for the giftings of people like Mark and, and others that I can name here in our church who just have that ability to counsel well. Lord, I pray that those who need that help, who need that shoulder or that, that support system to continue to walk them through their junk, that you provide it and you open those doors and open their eyes and humble hearts. And Lord, for us as a church, I pray that we are a place that is accepting of the former pig farmers who had hit rock bottom but are willing to leave their sin behind but need someone to help along the way and allow us not to receive them as servants but as dead men who have come to life. Lord, I thank you for that message of hope that you give to all who have breath. And it's in his, in your son's name we ask those things. Amen. Have a great week.